So my first question to you all is, is this really something we now need to do as well as teaching children English? And isn't teaching English a global skill in its own right anyway? And are global skills another ELT bandwagon that will pass with time? And what are global skills anyway? And how do they relate to other terms we've become familiar with, such as 20th century skills and life skills? And if actually by the end of preschool, what really counts is that children can understand and produce simple pre-A1 language structures and vocabulary, why do we need to bother? So in this webinar, we're going to address and explore these issues. We're going to look at what global skills are, why they are so important, and crucially, how to go about teaching them with practical examples for preschool based on a range of different activities. My aim is to persuade you, or perhaps I don't need to, that global skills are here to stay and that the sooner we adopt a methodological approach in which we integrate them into our teaching as a matter of course and not in a bitty piecemeal way, we will help to give young children's education overall coherence, create responsible and effective global citizens of the future, and ensure that learning English gets off to a good start and is engaging and worthwhile. Now, there are several well-established models or frameworks for global skills. And I'd like to start by looking briefly at two of them. The first, is UNESCO's four pillars of education. And the four pillars are learning to know, in other words, developing knowledge and thinking skills to understand the complexities of the world, including metacognition and learning to learn. The second pillar is learning to do, in other words, acquiring the social and digital skills to participate effectively in a global society. The third pillar is learning to live together, developing an understanding, appreciation, acceptance, and tolerance of other peoples and cultures. And the fourth pillar is learning to be. And what this involves is learning to self-regulate, to manage your emotions, and to act with a sense of confidence autonomy and personal responsibility. The second model I'd like us to look at is the OECD PISA Global Competences Framework. And this is described as four related capacities which comprise knowledge, skills, values, and attitudes. So we have the capacity to examine local, global, and intercultural issues. We have the capacity to understand and appreciate the world views of others. We have the capacity to take action for collective well-being and sustainable development. Think of the UN Global Goals, things such as climate change, hunger and poverty. And the last capacity, the capacity to engage in open, appropriate and effective interactions across cultures. And I think looking at this begs the question, why are global skills important? And it would be great if you put some of your ideas in the chat box. I mean, this is not rocket science, but I think it's important for us to establish this before going further. And in order not to spend too long on this, I'm going to show you some reasons and give you time to read each one. And what I'd like you to do in the chat box is to put colours and numbers to rate them. Numbers from one, not very important, to five, very important. So as an example, there's one reason. And we might think, yeah, that is really important. So I'm going to put, yeah, you have already. Brilliant. Blue, five. OK. So let's have a look at the next one. What about this one? I'm not going to read them all out. I'm just leaving them to you to read. Five as well. Is that a five? 
Getting a five. Very important. Yeah. Okay. What about this one? Not sure what the color is there. Brown, wine, red. Okay. Yes, five. Okay. We're getting overwhelming fives. What about this one? Super important. Yeah, you're absolutely right. That one in red really is a very important one. And the next one, what about this one? The green one? Five, five, five. All of them fives. Okay, fantastic. I hope I'm giving you time to read them. What about this one? Is this important as well? Okay, Laura's all thinking yes, Lara as well. Four, slightly less important. Okay, that's that's interesting. Yeah, that's interesting. And I can I can I can see what you're getting at there as well. What about this one? How important is that? Very important. Yeah. Okay. And one more there. Very important as well. So all of these are actually reasons that show why global skills are so important. I think you probably will have noticed that those two models I showed you earlier are very much, you know, thinking of adult, older learners. And I think in order for the development of global skills to be effective and successful, it needs to start young. Um, some of you may be familiar with that old Jesuit adage, give me a child until they are seven that ideas and attitudes and values and beliefs are all formed very young. And global skills need to be developed in a coherent way over the whole curriculum. And this means that we need a framework for developing global skills in ELT with children. The ones I showed you are all very well, but they're not specifically adapted for children. So here is the framework that I propose. And my framework takes as its starting point, children and their learning. And in a whole child approach, this means their stage of social, cognitive, psychological, emotional, physical, creative and language development. And leading them, leading them to have agency, in other words, choice, autonomy, involvement in decision making in their learning to take increased responsibility for their learning actions and behavior and also to develop a unique personal voice in expressing their ideas and opinions and to take positive action in order to contribute to the local community or global community as they get older in order to improve or change the world. Now, feeding into and empowering the child and their learning are, I think, eight global skills areas. And the first one, values education. In other words, the positive beliefs and ethics that underpin children's developing view of the world. Secondly, learning about the world, acquiring knowledge and understanding of the world to inform and shape their views. So some of us were familiar with this if we, we use CLIL or content-based learning in our classes. And related to this, of course, another hugely important area, thinking skills, including creative and critical thinking, problem solving, as well as metacognitive skills and children's ability to think about their thinking and reflect on their learning. Another key area, social and emotional learning. In other words, developing positive self-esteem, learning how to self-regulate and manage emotions and collaborate with others. And of course, we can't leave out language and communication skills. And here is the area that we are so familiar with and also already so good at in English. And I would also include here safeguarding and developing children's multilingualism. Another hugely important skill area is multiliteracies. And here I would include basic literally, basic literacy, and as children grow older, digital literacies 
and the ability to use a wide range of digital technologies safely and effectively for social, cultural and academic purposes. Related to that, we also have the area of interculturality and citizenship, including respect, tolerance, acceptance, valuing other cultures and promoting children's multilingual identities. And the last skills area I have here is life skills. In other words, I'm thinking here of the practical skills for coping with life on a day-to-day -day basis at home and school. So for preschool children, this might be, for example, learning how to put your coat on independently. And for older children, it might be to do with staying, learning how to stay safe online. So this then is my framework, but I think there are also some important messages for how we implement it. And the first is this, that integrating global skills is an educational philosophy. As I'm sure some of you will have noticed, none of the skills I mentioned are new. They've been around since well before the start of this century. I know I've been implementing them in materials I write, in my teaching and my teacher education work for years. But I think what's different is that rather than focusing on these skills in perhaps a not very systematic way, they are part of a whole educational approach or philosophy. This is reflected in the models of UNESCO and PISA that I, that I showed you earlier, and the aim to create competent, responsible global citizens and make for a coherent, sustainable, joined up approach to children's learning across the curriculum and from the moment they start school. And this leads me to my next point, that global skills are transferable across subject areas as well as inside and outside school. They affect every area of children's lives and their relevance and integration in different subject areas is also increasingly reflected in national ministry curriculums. The next point, that global skills are inclusive and accessible to everyone. In the same way that we cater for diversity and learning differences and use strategies and techniques to differentiate instruction in our language teaching, we can do the same for global skills. And of course, global skills need to be implemented in ways that are age appropriate. And obviously the kind of global skills we teach at preschool are going to be very different from lower secondary. And I think in a way we can see age appropriacy as the layers of an onion moving outwards from the child's immediate world at home and in the classroom um, to looking at more challenging um, global issues such as poverty, hunger, climate change and social justice in the real world as they get older. The next point that assessment is key to effective practice, that making global skills part of the overall curriculum and part of assessment gives them significance and value. The key of course is how to do it. An assessment of global skills needs to be qualitative, holistic and formative, ideally part of an assessment for learning approach that involves establishing learning outcomes and success criteria with children and subsequently reflecting on how well these have been met and what children need to do to learn more and collecting work as part of an English folder or portfolio is highly appropriate for this. The next point is to think global at every stage of your teaching. Now, what this means is planning lessons with aims and outcomes, not just for language skills, but global skills as well. And it means making the most of all those on the spot moments in every lesson for promoting thinking and developing global skills. And it also means when you get children to review their learning, you don't just focus on language skills, but global skills areas as well. And the last point here, perhaps the most 
important. Don't be afraid to start small. Even when you're teaching seemingly mundane, routine course book topics like clothes or family, there are opportunities to build in the development of global skills. With clothes, it might be talking about the positive value of wearing recycled clothes from older siblings. With families, it's likely to be promoting acceptance and respect for different kinds of families. You can also regularly show that you value children's multilingualism. For example, asking how to say a new word in their home language and inviting comparisons between their languages. Okay, so that's kind of by way of introduction. And let's have a look now at three practical examples of how to go about integrating global skills into our everyday teaching based on different themes and activities. And as we look at these examples, I'd like to ask you to think about how they develop any of the eight global skills areas in my framework and put any notes, comments, or ideas that occur to you in the chat box. So the first example is a story leading to a collaborative project. I'm going to tell you the story and show how it links to the project, but I'm not going to do all the pre-while post story work that you would do with a real class. And think of the learning um, that derives from the story. And I'm just seeing there that someone has said, I think all of them should be put in a context. And that's absolutely right. And that's really what we're going to be moving on to do. So I'm going to tell you the story of um, Shelley the shark. And in order to do this, so you can see my puppets better, I'm going to um, come out of, um, I'm going to come out of the presentation for a minute so that you can see better there. Okay, so Shelley is a beautiful big shark. She's got big teeth, fins, and a tail. Shelley's always hungry and she eats everything in the sea. One day she eats something that gets stuck in her tummy. She has a terrible tummy ache. Along comes a green and white fish. Hello, fish. Don't be afraid. I won't eat you. I've got something stuck in my tummy and it hurts. Can you help me, please? Of course I can. The green and white fish looks in Shelley's mouth. It pulls and it pulls, but nothing comes out. Along comes a red and white fish. Hello, fish. Don't be afraid. I won't eat you. I've got something stuck in my tummy and it hurts. Can you help me, please? Of course I can. The red and white fish looks in Shelley's mouth. It pulls and it pulls but nothing comes out. You can all join in with me at home or school or wherever you are. Along comes a seahorse. Hello, seahorse. Don't be afraid. I won't eat you. I've got something stuck in my tummy and it hurts. Can you help me, please? Of course I can. The seahorse looks in Shelley's mouth, it pulls and it pulls, but nothing comes out. And what do you think comes along next? Can you guess? Along comes an octopus. Hello, octopus. Don't be afraid. I won't eat you. I've got something stuck in my tummy and it hurts. 
Can you help me, please? Of course I can. Look at my long tentacles. The octopus puts his tentacles in Shelley's mouth and pulls and pulls and pulls. And guess what comes out? Can you guess what comes out? Ideas in the chat box. Can you guess what comes out? A plastic bottle. A plastic box. And a plastic bag. Oh, thank you, octopus. I feel much better now. But Octopus is angry and worried. He says, he says, plastic is bad for us. Plastic is bad for the sea. Let's clean the sea now and teach people a lesson. He calls a meeting of all the fat animals and they agree. Hooray! Great idea. Off they go, all of them, to collect the plastic. But where can they put it? Listen to the children's ideas. Maybe they say, under the rocks, in a net, in a boat, and then maybe you might use your class puppet. What's that? What's that, Mimi? Oh, that's a good idea. Mimi thinks maybe you can use Lego bricks to build a bin for all the plastic waste the sea animals collect. You think that's a good idea and you think it will be fun? Okay. So, this story actually develops language skills with its repeated um, narrative pattern and the values of helping, empathy, kindness, and taking positive collaborative action. It also, of course, relates to the global goals, particularly number 14, looking after the environment and life under the sea. And it also provides a context for a collaborative STEM project. And here I am going back to my presentation now. So you can see the goals that the story relates to, and we're moving on to our STEM project. STEM, of course, science, technology, engineering, and math. And as UNESCO said in 2015, the strengthening of STEM education is a key strategy for meeting the sustainable goals, edu development goals. So we need to make the bricks available. And we also, of course, need to do some preparatory language work. So for example, we might do, show me a big red brick, show me a small yellow brick. We might do, which is good fun, a Lego dictation. Put a red brick on a blue brick. Now put a yellow brick on the blue brick and so on. And for making the bin to collect the plastic, get children into pairs or groups. You need to demonstrate and model making part of the bin using the Lego. Let's put a big brick here. Let's put a blue brick here. And you can also show an image of a possible bin or draw one on the board. Before children start, it's a good idea to use pictures to talk about how they are going to work together. Are they going to work as in picture one or in picture two? What do you think? Put your ideas in the chat box. Yes, picture one, absolutely. And why do they think that will help them make a better bin? And by doing this, you convey to children that you value and give importance to the way they collaborate and help each, help each other. And it's also preemptive in preventing any possible classroom management problems. So when they have made their bin, you can get children to use 
critical thinking to make any adjustments they think necessary to improve their bins. For example, this one hasn't got a bottom and it hasn't got a lid. Children can then compare and talk about their bins. Our bin is white, blue and yellow. Our bin is big, our bin is strong, etc. And then you, they might look at all the classes bin, which one do they think is best and why? And what will they do to make a better bin next time? And of course, from what we've done so far, children can go on to learn more about plastic, about recycling, and about looking after the environment. So let's pause at that point and have a look at a global skills review. You can see on the left there, I have the eight global skills areas, and on the right, examples of possible outcomes. Now, I'm not gonna read all this out, so if you want a copy of it, take a screenshot now. But I think what I really want to highlight is the way that language and communication skills outcomes are just one element in the overall global skills development. They include a range of STEM, cell, social and emotional learning, values education, life skills areas. And by contextualizing them in this way, they are likely to be achieved more effectively and children are also more likely to remember and participate and use the language. Okay, let's move on now. In my second example, the main focus is on social and emotional learning, taking pride and pleasure in what you can do and developing a positive attitude towards work and making an effort. The activities are also based around singing songs and learning a language structure and vocabulary, uh, which is very something we very, which we very commonly teach. In this case, can for ability and actions, parts of the body and animals. So as with the first example, please think about how um, these activities develop any aspects of global skills and put your ideas in the chat box. So the first thing we're going to start with is an action song, okay? And as with the previous example, I'm not gonna do all the activities you typically do with your class before singing and acting out the song, which is what we're going to do now. And I'm going to come out of the presentation to do this. And I want all of you, although I can't check, to stand up and move away from your devices and join in as we sing and dance to this song. So are you ready everyone? Move away from your devices, stand up, and here we go. My body. Listen. Listen and sing. Are you all ready? I can dance. You can dance too. Everybody stand up. I can dance, you can dance too. Listen to the music, here's what we do. Move your arms, move your arms, move your legs, move your legs. Listen to the music, dance to the beat. Move your Well, did you enjoy that? <laughs> I have no idea whether you enjoyed, whether you joined in or just sat looking at the screen as if I'm mad. But the fact is we use songs frequently in our preschool classes. And at the end of the day, when we go home, uh, we can't get them out of our heads. So what are some of the benefits of using songs, do you think? Put your, I, I put some ideas in the chat box. 
they, they raise the mood, they make you feel happy. Everyone participates and joins in. It's a social event. Um, and actually children are breathing at the same time as they sing. And this creates a community bond. And of course, we're giving children an opportunity for physical movement and they need to move. And we do too, actually, by the way. And the kinesthetic association of words and actions reinforces understanding and the tune and the rhythm and the beat and miming words and doing actions helped to make it um, memorable. So building on our song, and I'll go back to my presentation now, building on my song, on our song, uh, we might do a hula hoop action game. Uh, and basically this game, we put a large hula hoop on the, on, the, on the floor and children take turns to jump into the hoop and act out or mime doing an action and saying a, set, saying a sentence. For example, I can jump, I can hop, I can run, I can climb. And some children, of course, may only name the action. They won't say a sentence and some may just do the action, not say anything at all. And you know what? That is absolutely fine. And the really important thing is to respond positively to their participation and effort. And of course, as I'm sure you'll realize, this is a game that we can play with other structures as well. So, for example, with I like or I've got. And with older children, once they're familiar with the game, we might have several different colored hoops, for example, blue for can, red for like, green for I've got, and children take turns to jump into the hoops and do actions and say sentences in the same way. And actually, this is a lovely way of getting children to say chunks, produce chunks of languages, of language, rather than just isolated um, vocabulary. We might move on to talk to find out about what animals can do. And of course, this links to global goals and life on life on Earth, goal number um, 15. OK, so an elephant can walk, for example, a giraffe can run, a frog can jump, OK, a monkey can climb, a crocodile can do lots of things, can swim, okay, and a parrot can fly. And you can say sentences about the animals and children supply the word. And we can also, of course, do a lovely drama game. Can you walk like an elephant, okay? We get all our children walking like elephants and then we say stop. And when you say stop, they have to freeze. And that's also a very good classroom management technique because you get them to, you get their attention and stop them moving around. And children can of course categorize the animals that do the different actions, developing thinking skills there. And of course, when we're talking about can and what people can do, I think one of the very important things is to develop in children a can-do mindset, okay? In other words, um, helping them to develop a growth mindset based on the work of Carol Dweck, and I'm sure a lot of you are very familiar with this, but what I mean here, and Carol Dweck's concept of a growth mindset, is that children develop a belief in their own ability to learn and to overcome challenges through effort and hard work. That actually, if they can't do something, it's not that they just can't do it and that's it, which is a fixed mindset. It's that through their effort, um, they can do it um, independently. And this is a very, very important value to instill in children from an early age, that they actually recognize their own agency um, in being able to succeed and do things. So bearing in mind the benefits of singing that we talked about earlier, let's sing and act out this song now, but I'm gonna keep the text on the screen. You've got the, I mean, this obviously would be um, the text here for teachers, not for the children. Um, so I'd like you to do it with me this time. You don't have to get up from your devices, um, but just do the actions that you can see in red there on the text. So are you ready? Off we go. My
Okay, sorry. They jumped. My body. Right. Values lesson. Listen and sing. I can do it if I try. develop a growth mindset but it's also really important to recognize that children don't learn or acquire values overnight and the song itself is the starting point for a process once children are familiar with the song you can remind them of it whenever they find something difficult or challenges by saying remember what Mimi sings I can do it if I try and a thumbs up gesture and always showing that you value the efforts children make in the feedback and praise that you give. So having looked at that, those, those activities based on songs and developing language around um, can and various vocabulary areas, let's have a look at a global skills um, review. And again, I'm not gonna read all this out, but here are notes with examples of possible outcomes in the eight global skills areas. And here, of course, we have a strong focus on values education and social and emotional learning, um, but also, of course, here on language and communication skills too. Moving on to the third example, um, we're going to use a story and this story can either be told by you using the pictures or you can use audio or video and it's about food and a visit to the supermarket to ra raise children's awareness about food they eat and the importance of a healthy diet and what is a treat and again I'm not going to do all the pre-while post story work that you would obviously need to do with the real class and again I would like you to think about how this story and related activities develop any aspect of global skills in my framework and put your um, comments in the chat box. Okay, so this story then is called I Like Ice Cream. So here in the kitchen are Daddy, Mimi, and Dylan there with his da -da 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 toy drum. And daddy has got to do the shopping and he's saying, let's make a shopping list. Mm, eggs, uh, apples, carrots, cereal, bananas, milk. And Dylan gets going with his drum and he goes around the kitchen going, eggs, apples, carrots, cereal, bananas, milk. Eggs, apples, carrots, cereal, bananas, milk. Eggs, apple, carrot, cereal, bananas, milk. Oh, Dylan. Oh, Dylan. Oh, you are funny, says Mimi. And Daddy says, shush, Dylan, come on, let's go. And Dylan says, I don't like shopping. So they get to the supermarket. And hey, guess what, Daddy? Can't find the shopping list. 
Oh no, where's the shopping list? I can help, says Dylan. Da, 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 da. Eggs, apple, da, uh, uh. And Mimi says, and I can help too. Eggs, says Dylan. Very good, says Danny. Put the eggs in the trolley. Da, 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 da. Eggs, apple, says Mimi. Yes, very good, Mimi. Put the apples in the trolley. And ice cream, says Dylan. No, Dylan, ice cream isn't on the list. Oh, I like ice cream. Eggs, apples, carrots. Yes, very good, Dylan. Put the carrots in the trolley. Do, 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 do. Eggs, apples, carrots, cereal. Yes, very good, Mimi. Put the cereal in the trolley. And ice cream, says Dylan. No, Dylan, ice cream isn't on the list. Oh, I like ice cream. Do, 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 Eggs, apples, carrots, cereal, bananas. Yes, very good, Dylan. Put the bananas in the trolley. Eggs, apples, carrots, cereal, bananas, milk. Yes. Very good, Mimi. Put the milk in the trolley. And ice cream? No, Dylan, ice cream isn't on the list. Oh, I like ice cream. Oh, look, silly me, says Daddy. Here is the shopping list. Let's just check. Eggs, apples, Carrots, cereal, bananas, milk. Da, 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 da. Eggs, apples, carrots, cereal, bananas, milk, and ice cream? No, Dylan, ice cream isn't. Uh, well, yes, maybe. You and Mimi are my little helpers. Let's have a treat. Ice cream is on the shopping list today. Oh, thank you, Daddy. I like ice cream. And Dylan says, I like ice cream too. And I think I like shopping. Hooray! Okay, so that's the end of our little story where Dylan's annoying chant and drum actually saves the day when the shopping list gets lost. And of course, what we want to do is to add an element of personalization and intercultural learning and provide an opportunity for children to relate the story to their own lives and find out about the similarities and differences between themselves and their peers. For example, do you go to the supermarket? Who do you go with? What food is on your shopping list? And children might circle the foods they buy and draw a picture of one other food they buy. And you obviously may need to help with the words if necessary. And then with older children, they might do a pair work activity. Do you buy apples? Yes, no. Do you buy bread? Yes, no, and so on. And a natural extension to this story is to learn about to raise children's awareness of healthy food and treats. However, I think it's really, really important to do this in a light way, okay? So children might listen and name the food, and then they color green, the spots of food that are good for you, and talk about the food. Oranges are good for you. Cakes are a treat. Apples are good for you. Ice cream is a treat. And I think it's really important not to say bad for you, as this is very black and white. And we also know that as children get older, at least in many countries of the world, they can easily develop obsessions about food and their body image and weight. So here, I think the concept of treat is a useful one. You know, this food is okay from time to time, but not as a regular everyday food. We might also do a food project, a collaborative project, where children use modelling clay 
to make plates of food. And this, of course, it's up to you whether it's plates of food they like or plates of food that are good for them or plates of treats. And an important principle of projects with this age group is that every child works individually to make a con contribution to a collaborative outcome. So you underline the team message, which I'm sure you know, which stands for T-E-A-M, together, everyone achieves more. And of course, you can also do activities based on the children's completed projects. Find the plate with an apple. How many plates have orange food? How many plates have treats? And children can also develop the thinking skill of categorizing by categorizing fruit and vegetables according to color. You can use real fruit and vegetables for this or plastic, and they draw them in the correct place on the table. And you can ask children if they think of other colors and fruit and vegetables to add. For example, red or green apples, purple grapes or plums, white cauliflower, and make the point that it's good for us to regularly eat fruit and veg of all different colors. Also linked to this theme, we can set up a learning station in our classroom, a food shop. And this would come, and this is very important to say this, this would come after we had done um, a shopping activity as a whole class activity. And when we set up a learning station, this would gives children an opportunity to play independently in pairs or small groups for perhaps five minutes at the end of a lesson when they finish other work. And they might, it depends how you set it up, of course, but they might use language like, I want a banana, please. Here you are. Thank you. And they take turns to be shopkeeper and customer and play. And of course, learning stations develop global skills in the way they provide opportunity to put into personal skills into practice. And while some children play at the learning station, others can do the categorization we've seen, we've just seen, or they might play a snakes and ladders food game, which you can also do as a whole class activity, throwing a dice and counting the squares and moving up the ladders and down the stakes. For example, if you or a child throws a four on the boat, on the dice, you count one, two, three, four, and up the ladder you go. And then maybe the next child throws a two on the dice and you move and everyone counts together if you're doing it as a whole class activity. One, two, and oh dear down the snake okay and obviously with younger children you would do this as a whole class and lead it older children can play in pairs and it develops turn taking collaborative skills as well as attitudes such as not minding when you lose a game and you can also um, use this template um, to for, for any vocabulary that you want to practice um, and once children are familiar with the game, this becomes very easy, of course. Um, one last activity I wanted to show you, particularly because it relates to the global goals, is getting children aware of how to make good use of food and not to waste it. Because, you know, in some countries of the world, apparently, we throw away thousands of kilos of food each week terrible. So this activity is to do with um, goal number two and hunger and responsible consumption. And basically it's looking at when we have old bread, leftover bread or ripe bananas and how we can make use of them. And there are many different ways and this is very cultural of course. I mean in Spain we might use them for gazpacho, in Portugal we might use them for a dish called asorda with seafood, um, in England, we might use them, although it's a very old fashioned dish, but bread and butter pudding. Um, and similarly with ripe bananas, we can use them to make a smoothie or a milkshake or banana sandwiches or banana ice cream. And actually banana ice cream is much better with riper bananas 
than um, than ones that are less than ones that are less right. And I know most of us don't have the facilities to do this, for example, to make a milkshake with children. But what we do have and what it's very important to foster is the homeschool link so that actually as part of our teaching, we can inform parents of our objective of raising children's awareness of not wasting food and ask them to involve their children in a way of using stale bread or ripe bananas in a recipe at home. Okay, so as with the other two examples, let's have a global skills review. And I think you can see there how the example um, outcomes show how children are learning far more than just language and integrating um, other areas of the curriculum and learning to self-regulate and developing thinking skills in a way that is contextualized and coherent. So I hope that these examples have showed you that there are many advantages to developing global skills in our language teaching with young children. And what, what happens when you do this? You enhance their confidence and self-esteem. You develop their agency, autonomy, and unique personal voice. You contribute to their educational success and lifelong learning. You prepare them for their future employment. It may be a long way ahead, but these attitudes and mindsets, we can't start to develop them too soon. Uh, you create competent, caring, responsible, and active global citizens. Crucially, you make learning English an engaging, worthwhile, and integrated component of their education and empower them to act positively in the real world. So this brings me to the nearly the end of my session. And if you remember back, we had a look at two established models for, models for developing global skills. We talked about why global skills are important. We, I presented, shared with you my framework for developing global skills in ELT with children. And we also talked about key messages for implementing this successful. We then had a look at three practical examples. If you can remember that we had the shark story and STEM project. We had the two songs and talking about what you can do. And then we had the supermarket shopping story and learning about food. And lastly, we talked about the benefits of integrating global skills into our teaching on an everyday basis. And so my final message to you is this, um, integrate global skills and help young children become responsible, caring members of the community, as well as engaged and confident language learners. So that brings me to the end. Thank you very much for being there and for all your participation in the chat box. And over to Louise. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Carol. That was wonderful. That was really inspiring. You can see that there are loads and loads and loads of comments that they were just going through the chat box so quickly. I couldn't keep up with all the comments, but all really positive, all very congratulatory and all very um, kind of people are motivated and want to start using your ideas, I think, straight away. So that's Absolutely. wonderful. Um, excellent. There are a couple of questions that appeared in the question and answer um, box, and I'd like to, if that's OK with you, put them to you. Um, there is a question about, um, again, and it came up this morning, about um, getting parents or families on, on, on board, that it's not easy. Um, that, that sometimes that communication is quite difficult. It's from um, Nada. Um, she says um, that, um, well, yes, she does her best to help develop their skills, their competences, 
Um, but at the same time, some students' environment hinders that development and yes. to, to families can, can, can be very yeah. difficult, if not yeah. always impossible, so if they're not flexible or understanding. So any advice from you or thoughts on that would be most I, I mean, I think that's a really good question to raise. And I think it is absolutely funda fundamentally important to do whatever we can. And of course, there are some occasions when it isn't possible, but to do whatever we can to create a positive homeschool link. And this depends on um, communication with parents, whether you have a language in common with the parents or whether they can communicate in English or in some cases, you know, you may even need help with that. But I think regular information is really important, as well as very concrete suggestions and guidelines about what parents can do with their children to support their English. Because parents of very young children are often, they're really, really keen to get involved with their children's learning. You know, later on, they're less keen, you know, but at this age, they want to do everything they can. And for example, something very simple, you know, like parents may say to children when they come home, well, what did you do in English today? And the child kind of shrugs their shoulders and says, nothing, nothing much. And the parent doesn't really know how to follow up on that. But if they have information from you telling them about, you know, our next unit of work is on food, we're going to be doing this, that and the other, you know, at home, it would be great if you can ask them about the story. Did you like the story? Um, can you make a chant out of our shopping list when we go to the supermarket? You know, to actually, in other words, to give parents the input so that they can um, talk talk to their children about it because I think we have to remember that it's very much you know that it's a triangular relationship we have a hugely important role in children's education but parents have an even more important one and so we need to get them on side although I understand it's not it's not always possible but it, it takes work on our side we can't just automatically expect it to happen yes and i think your point about giving them input is important guiding them yes. help, you know ideas as you say of how they can because one thing is to say yes do it but you need to give them uh, guidelines and, and yeah help. absolutely You're absolutely right and another question um that uh, this is from Alicia, and uh, she says, many thanks, thanks for the presentation. Um, she says that she has to teach children or English to kids that are two years of age, they're very young. Can I use all these global skills as they are very, very little? Do you, know, I, do you know something? I think two-year-olds is another, I mean, I've been thinking of kind of as from three with yeah. this, um, I mean, but a lot of the activities we did today were not suitable also for, for three-year-olds. So I think what you need to do is to think, do you remember in the talk at one point, I talked about layers of the onion? Yes. You know, for global skills. And I think the younger the child is, the closer it has to be um, to their immediate world and needs and interests and when we're talking about you know when we're talking about two year well when we're talking about three year olds or four or five but you know at two children are you know they're very very egocentric and this is not a stage that we can skip in their development through our global skills instruction so so no I mean, you know, that is that is a reality of children's world. But we can do things, for example, you know, to just very gradually begin to get them to be aware of the consequences of their actions. Um, for example, you know, if they grab someone else's toy that actually, you know, it's not very nice to have your toy grabbed away. So to try and build up these skills of empathy and fairness, but 
it's got to be in a way that is um, in sync with the child's developmental level. I mean, with three-year-olds, you know, even, you know, like the story of Shelley the shark, well, you could tell that story and the plastic, but they're going to, un they're going to understand that environmental implication in a very different way from five-year-olds, for example, or older children that you could do a version of the story with as well. Absolutely. That's a really, really good point. Yeah. So we can't apply everything. The child's developmental stage is key. Absolutely key. And I think that's why, I mean, to be honest, this is what motivated me to develop this framework. Because when I look at, you know, the UNESCO, the, you know, the, the PISA one and all, they're, they're very much focused on adults and mature, um, mature learners. And always the crucial thing when we're talking about children is to develop a framework that actually allows for that, for that developmental progress. Because we know that children, even during the school year, they change hugely. And so our kind of approach needs to be able to, um, you know, to be flexible to go with that. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's wonderful. Thank you so much, Carol. Eh? Uh, it's been a real pleasure. Uh, the, the talk has been excellent. And you can see, again, people are still commenting in the chat box and saying, Thank you for these ideas and the people that you've, the questions you've answered just now. People really appreciate that 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 input from you, and it's so important to make those sort of, um, you know, to, to to be more precise, no, and and not just um, come up with a one fit or a one answer fits all. And I think that's a key message. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Yes. No, I agree. I agree yes. with all our different contexts as well. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Fantastic. So thank you so much, Carol. I'm, but don't go away. I'm just. No, I thought there were more no, questions. No more questions. No, well, well, there were similar questions, and okay. I, I, you know, um, but I thought th those in particular were key ones that. Yeah, you, very good questions. I, Lovely I, I, questions. Um, okay, I'm just going to share my. I can share my screen. I believe now. As you all know, Carol Reed is the author of the Wheels series, Mimi's Wheel, the British English version, Ferris Wheel, the American English version. Um, it's a fabulous three-level pre-primary course where she has incorporated the global skills education in a very mm, age-appropriate, a very meaningful and practical way and also flexible, by the way the hop on and the hop off um, um, approach. So please do have a look at um, this wonderful course. Uh, you will see the um, webpage address here. Mm -hmm.